better <laughs> as we go through these questions. I'm excited. I'm excited too. Okay, so hey, it's Amanda Jenkins, and you're watching Founders telling the true stories of entrepreneurs to inspire people everywhere. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And today we're talking to Shasta Bays, founder of Dreams Soar, and the youngest woman to circumnavigate the globe in a single engine aircraft. Lately, we've really been hit by this concept that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And as the first certified civilian female pilot from Afghanistan, Shasta's mission was and continues to be to bring STEM education to girls globally. So if you've ever wondered what part you might play in helping to make the world a more fair and equitable place, our guest today has some ideas on how to do that. Shasta, thank you so much for being with us here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. We love Dream Soar and we're so inspired by your mission. I wonder if you could take us back to the early days, back to even Afghanistan, back to your childhood in California, and tell us how your dream sort of hatched. So I was born in 1987 during a really critical time in Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, Afghanistan was at war with the Soviet Union. And luckily, my family was able to get out of Afghanistan, get out of that war environment, and come as refugees to the United States. Uh, so I grew up uh, with me and my five sisters, um, kind of torn between two different cultures, the Afghani culture, which we experienced at home, and then I'd go to school, and then I'd be exposed to the American culture. Uh, for me, I just held on to what I uh, was most comfortable with. And that was seeing my mom and my grandma and generations before them who were all housewives and who stayed at home and took care of the family. So I thought that's my, my future. That's where my life is going to head to. And I was really happy with this idea. Um, growing up in, in Richmond, California, unfortunately, it was a very... Um, it was a very poor school district. I had a lot of substitute teachers. I couldn't take textbooks home. Um, and that was my, my childhood, uh, it, surrounded by kind of like the poverty in Richmond. Um, eventually, my family did move out of Richmond to a city called Fairfield, which had a much better school district. Uh, that's when I started to think about the future, think about maybe even going to college. Um, I stumbled into aviation, I fell in love with it, and uh, at age 17, I decided I want to become a pilot, I want to learn how to fly, and I've never looked back since then. Wow, what a story. I mean, I think anybody who's facing any type of adversity could be inspired by that story. Um, so take me from the idea to uh, the actual you know, implementation. I understand you had a mentor along the way, Jerry Mock. Um, how did your relationship with her help move this process along? So Jerry was a great inspiration to me. I'd read a lot about her and I, I decided I'm just gonna reach out to her family members and see if I could meet her. This was about two years ago. And I got a response back from uh, his, her granddaughter, Eddie. And uh, Jerry's, sorry, <laughs> I totally messed that up. <laughs> I'm gonna, if we can start from the beginning, it's actually her grandson. Okay, I, that's perfect. Okay, so I'll just start back. Yeah. So I had the privilege of meeting Jerry Mock about two years ago. I reached out to her family and got a response back from her grandson, Eddie, uh, who informed me that she was living uh, in the west coast of Florida and that she would love to meet me. I kind of shared with um, Jerry's family that I'm interested in flying around the world, but I, I don't know quite yet if this is something I wanna really pursue. Uh, so I sure enough got in my car, I was um, going through my master's degree uh, at Embry-Riddle, got into my car, it was a three hour drive, and the whole time I was thinking, well, what am I gonna share with Jerry? I, I was a little intimidated to be honest, cause she was such a fierce, strong, brave woman. Uh, so I pull up to her house, I, I um, get to her door, I knock, and here's Jerry, this five foot one petite woman who opens the door, and she just invites me very warm and welcomely into her home. Um, I sat down and I thought, well, you know, 
I guess the first question that I'm going to ask Jerry is, Jerry, what did you do after you, you flew around the world? And to my surprise, she said the first trip that I took after uh, completing uh, um, the journey of flying around the world solo in 1964 is that I went to Afghanistan. And for me, that opened the door to feel more comfortable, to share her who really I am, my background. Because at that time, I thought my backgrounds were um, just big mountains for me to overcome, being a refugee, being from a, a um, coming from poverty and, and not knowing that I wanted to be a pilot since I was a little girl. It, you know, there was just a lot of these internal challenges that I was dealing with. So... Jerry opened that door. I felt comfortable sharing my background with her and she believed in me. She said, you're going to do it. You're going to make history and you're going to fly around the world. I know it. And that um, opened up to a relationship that I had with her um, where times were different, but the concept of, of flying a plane is pretty much the same, whether you do it in 1964 or in 2017. Uh, so before she passed away, uh, I'd often call her once a week and just give her updates. And it would take her back to her planning days, which was really cool. And she'd share stories here and there. Um, but she helped me a lot. Her words, um, you know, for some reason, I thought she would say, well, it's, it's really it's hard work. Uh, but to my surprise, she was encouraging. She supported me. And she really was the initial driving force for me to really take this seriously and, and to pursue flying around the world. Wow. That story really actually touches my heart. Aww. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is really cool. Like women helping other women sort of, you know, understand and, and to be able to understand what this was going to look like to actually fly around the world. So, okay. So now you've hatched this idea and you're, you're planning this, this, this extraordinary flight around the world. Um, how did you come up with the funds and the manpower to support you in such a big endeavor? How uh, I came up with kind of getting the flight plan together, the funding and the team is, uh, it, it's my honest belief, if you have a really good heart with a good cause um, and you're genuine about what you wanna do, people are gonna react and so, I remember attending Oshkosh. Uh, it's called the EAA uh, Air Venture in Wisconsin, which is a huge aviation air show. And uh, the night before, I had printed 50 business proposals that I had put up, uh, put together. And um, it was just a lot of Googling on my own and, and figuring out what to put in a proposal, printed 50 copies. And the minute that that air show, the gates opened and I got in, I mean, I was talking to everyone and just sharing this concept of flying around the world to inspire other young girls. I just, I felt so passionate about it. And, you know, I, I definitely had a lot of uh, discouraging responses, but also too, I had very motivating, very, um, I had people who were just genuinely interested and said, Here's my number. Uh, once you get the plane and your team together, give me a call. Uh, so that's how it started out. I mean, you just kind of take a leap of faith and you go for it. Um, so it's important, whatever you decide to do in life, that you're really genuinely passionate about it because it will get you through. It will give you the energy to get up and and to talk to so many people and share your dream. Uh, but but that air show was was huge for me. And this was about five years ago where I attended that air show. And from there, like I said, I'd meet people. Some would say, hey, I want to help you plan this a little bit better. I eventually put together um, a team of people who all volunteers uh, contributed to the planning and the preparations of the flight. And uh, eventually this concept that I had walking around at the air show turned into a nonprofit organization, Dream Soar. And from there, we have a, a very well-seasoned board of directors, advisory council, dream team members who all came together, helped with the fundraising, helped with um, planning out the stops, the outreach events. So, you know, you might not start with much in the beginning, but the more that you work towards your dream, the more that you'll see that things come together. That's fantastic. I think it's it's like a lot of the entrepreneurs that I talk to. I mean, it's a lot at first it's a lot of sweat equity and it's a big learning curve, but then, you know, things start to snowball. It sounds like that's what happened for you too. And I'm so glad it did. Um, 
since I first found out about you, Shasta, I sort of learned more about women in aviation. And I discovered that there are only 450 female airline uh, captains worldwide. And only 6% of licensed pilots worldwide are women. Talk to me about the gender gap in aviation and what you think is causing it. So there is a really big gender gap in aviation. And uh, from my research, because I did a lot of studies during my master's program as to why women are not attracted to aviation. And there are sev several different factors. I think the biggest one is um, cost. It's, it's expensive to uh, invest your future into aviation, flight training, um, whether you want to get a degree behind your flight training or not. Uh, costs is, is the, one of the biggest factors. Um, a second factor that I actually didn't realize until uh, much later is geographics. Uh, so I come from a Middle Eastern um, background. If And if my father were to have had a son, um, my family wouldn't have been able to financially support me because usually in the Middle Eastern cultures, the funds usually goes to the son because he carries out the family name. Um, and, and I think... The third biggest factor is, is that there is a big lack of role models. Uh, even for me starting out, it was important for me to identify pilots who looked like me, who were like me, to give me proof that before I go down this road, um, women before me have been successful, therefore I will be successful. Uh, so, so I think those are the three biggest factors, finance, uh, geographics, and, and cultures, along with finding role models to show young girls that they can be successful in a career where it is very male dominated. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and Shasta, as you know, this interview is um, in part sponsored by bizjetjobs.com. Um, it's a resource for pilots that are seeking jobs in corporate aviation. And our founder, Rick Kubski, um, a pilot himself, had the privilege of meeting you at the NBAA conference this year, right when you got back from your, um, your voyage. And he actually had some questions for you on behalf of our member pilots at BizJet Jobs, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Hi, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch out my notes. Okay. I don't have a teleprompter yet. It's something I'm working on. Just have old school paper. Okay, there's nothing wrong with old school. <laughs> I know, right? Okay, so we'll start again. So pilots want to know, how did you plan the route that you would follow around the world? So the route was ever changing, to be honest with you. Uh, initially, I started out with destinations where I thought um, the outreach could really impact. Um, and once I started to look into fuel, um, the capabilities of my small single engine Bonanza aircraft, I quickly had to narrow down that route and really identify which airports um, would provide customs, would provide the fuel that I needed, which was uh, Avgas, 100 low lead fuel, and which airports would um, allow for a small single engine airplane to land in, because uh, there are a lot of big international airports that struggle with these smaller aircraft flying in. Uh, so with those factors in mind, um, the route that I had selected, uh, it, there was a lot of research, a lot of background, a lot of cold calls to these airports, uh, speaking with their managers, just kind of explaining why I'm flying around the world and why I'm flying into their particular airport. Uh, that was a big challenge. And even though, you know, I had a, a route set when I took off, um, that route changed uh, around the world with weather, with um, uh, different um different news that's going on around the world, political news uh, made me change my route. And, and so it, it's, you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants. Um, you do have a flight plan, but pilots usually know you don't. Sometimes there are uh, times where you have to deviate from that flight plan. Uh, but those factors are really the big contributing um, factors that kind of dictated the route. And, and um, yeah. Super. So then October 2017, you became the youngest woman to fly solo around the world um, in a single engine aircraft. And amazing. Um, 
Rick told me that flying a single engine aircraft can be nerve wracking anywhere you do it. So he says you often hear unexpected, unexplained, you know, banging, clanging right up next to you in the cockpit. Um, he told me he can't even imagine how that would feel, you know, during a Pacific crossing. So what, take me back. Um, what was it like, you know, during that Pacific crossing? How did you feel? I, I think the, um, more so than the Pacific, the Atlantic is more of the scarier ocean to cross simply because uh, the weather changes much quicker. Uh, you have harsher temperatures. Um, when you're up that north, you know, your airplane could be susceptible to icing. I mean, the Atlantic to me was more of the, the challenge. Um, and it's scary when, you know, in the Atlantic, of course, because uh, I, I was flying eastbound was the first ocean that I had to cross. Uh, so when you just when you kind of go away from land and you look out and you see nothing but oceans for miles and miles and miles and, you know, like four or five, six hours would pass by and you still see nothing but ocean. Um, it's it's a bit of an unsettling feeling. Uh, but for me. I remember once I got to my uh, halfway point across the Atlantic Ocean, my nerves started to, to come down a little bit. I started to feel a little bit more relaxed. And as I'm sitting there, I'm looking out, hoping that, you know, maybe I'll see a boat or a bird, you know, any sign of life. Um, and sure enough, I was really the only one out there. Uh, and I had this moment while I was over the ocean where I thought, so in the history of aviation, there's only been seven women who have ever crossed this ocean in a single engine aircraft. And I would have never thought that the eighth woman would be this refugee from Afghanistan who grew up in a very underprivileged school district thinking that she was going to get married at a young age and that's all that life had to offer her. I didn't think that the eighth woman would be to fly around the world would be me. So it was kind of like this euphoric moment over the ocean and there's no one there to share it with, but that's okay. Uh, so, you know, ocean crossings, they are one of, um, they are a challenge because you know in the back of your mind, you only have one engine, anything can happen, uh, but you just have to have faith, um, just like many pilots do. They have faith in aviation and they've been trained for whatever mission that they're about to embark on. Um, but that's kind of how I got through these big oceans. And you were the first from your country and really the first, right? The first uh, non-military um, female pilot, correct? From your country. That's correct. So when I started flight training, uh, again, we go back to role models in aviation. I had reached out to the Afghani government saying uh, that I'm looking to, to fly. If they had kind of like a roster of past female pilots that I could contact and reach out to. And to my surprise, I got a response back saying that there had never been a certified female civilian pilot from, Af from Afghanistan. And if I were to continue to get my license, that, I, that they would acknowledge me to be the first uh, female civilian pilot from Afghanistan. And that's all I needed to hear. Uh, those words were encouraging. I thought I need to pave the way for uh, Middle Eastern women, women from Afghanistan, women from around the world, just to say, you can come from a different background and still succeed in this industry. What an inspiration. Um, wow. Um, so back to the technical details. Um, I've seen some pictures of you in your jumpsuit. Uh, what did you have under that? Was it a survivor suit or a wetsuit? What, what, did, what did you have going on? I mean, it was like you said, it was cold. So for the Atlantic crossing, I did have to wear an immersion suit. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a gummy suit because you look like uh, it's just really odd. Um, even when you're sitting in it flying, it's just kind of uncomfortable. Uh, but it, it can save your life. It's, it's for safety. Um, oftentimes, uh, the flight suit was more for just, I guess, for show. Uh, but oftentimes when I'd fly, I'd dress really comfortable um, so that, you know, I could move around my very, very small cockpit. And over um, the ocean, I did have to wear that immersion suit just to keep me protected. I also had a life raft on board. I had oxygen. So, uh, you know, and I test my oxygen before taking off and I take a picture of it. Everyone was like, wow, that's so scary. You have all these um, 
hose attached to your nose and this big oxygen tank. Um, but these were um, these were materials that I needed to be safe uh, to fly around the world. But for the most part, uh, that my flight suit was just just I guess um, for fun. But then during the the big crossings, I would have to wear the real suit. Cool. Um, that sounds like quite an experience. And so you had the life raft. Um, you had a sat phone. Um, and I know you had a great team on the ground supporting you. Um, who monitored you while you were in the air? And I'm just curious, you know, if you ever had trouble communicating. Uh, I actually did. Um, <clears throat> so we go back to the Atlantic Ocean crossing. Uh, some people may or may not know, I actually attempted to cross the Atlantic twice. Uh, so the, for the first time, I took off from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And, uh, you know, here I am, I'm about 300 miles away from land. And I look over um, on my aircraft, there's uh, a, a system called the high frequency HF radio, which allows me to communicate with air traffic controllers over very remote areas of the world. Uh, so here I am 300 miles away from land. Um, and I look over, there's an antenna that goes from the side of my aircraft to the wingtip up to the tail. So it's like a big triangle. Uh, the antenna is about 28 feet long. It shears wow. off of the aircraft, slams into the fuselage of the airplane, and it's just dangling. Um, oh my, <laughs> my heart sinks because I'm thinking, my goodness, this antenna could wrap around my control surfaces. It could... Uh, the wind could push it towards the propeller, and you know I'm over the ocean. There's really nowhere to land, uh, so I quickly turned around. And Honeywell, they had uh, installed a, a equipment on board the aircraft called the Airwave, and with the Airwave, I had texting capabilities where I could <clears throat> text my team on the ground and just give them a heads up, like, "Hey, you know my my antenna just sheared off my aircraft. I'm turning back around." Uh, you know, this is the airport that I'm hoping to land at. Um, if you can make sure that there's a mechanic waiting for me. Uh, so it was really nice to have that communication with the ground team because things are, are ever changing. Landed the aircraft safely. Mechanic came, uh, took apart the aircraft. Sorry, took apart the antenna. I got back into the aircraft and flew to a different airport to get uh, maintenance help. Um, but our team consisted usually of, uh, of pilots. Um, you could visit dreamsore.org to kind of see a full list. Uh, but they were pretty much on standby just to make sure uh, nothing came up during the flight and uh, that I didn't need any sort of assistance when I landed um, at my destination airports. Fabulous. Um, another topic we were wondering about pilots often experience food related problems you know when they're traveling internationally um i heard that uh, the corporate aviation catering company air culinaire provided a special diet for you what did that entail so thank you a special thank you to air culinaire um because i was worried about the food as well i thought geez you know, if I start feeling sick after eating something, it's not like I could handle hand the flight controls over to someone else. It's only me and the aircraft. And oftentimes, um, my flight legs were nine, ten hours long. Uh, hold on, I think someone just came. One second. No worries. Okay. Do you want me to start over, or just kind of pick up from where I left off? Um, you can pick up where you left off. That's fine. So with, with me being in the aircraft, it's not like I could hand over the controls to another pilot. I was really worried about getting sick. Um, and Air Culinaire, they're just such, it's, they're such an amazing professional team. They did their research. They found out what foods would be available in different parts of the world. Uh, and they put together a really nice menu for each stop where it was nutritious, it was healthy, and they knew that the food that they were going to serve me um, were, were, it was healthy options and also safe to eat. Um, and to add to that, the business aviation community, even though I'm a general aviation aircraft, really stepped in and, and supported this flight wholeheartedly. Uh, we had several um, FBOs who usually manage business jets uh, cater to the Dream Store Global Flight and 
welcomed me and, and helped out with fuel and hangering the aircraft. Um, it was just incredible to see the business aviation community just kind of come together and uh, contribute to a greater cause. Wow, that's great to hear. Um, another thing the pilots were wondering about is that you were probably exhausted. Um, I know you were exhausted in October when you got back, but during the flight itself, how much rest did you take? Um, how did you make sure you got the rest that you needed? Um, were your hotels okay? How did that whole thing pan out? That's a really good question. So it's it's kind of tough to because you're you're dealing with different biorhythms, you're dealing with um, different time zones. Um, for me, when I would get to the airport, it was priority for me to get rest, rehydrate, um, and if I ever didn't feel up to flying, you know, there wasn't this pressure on me that you have to to depart tomorrow or you have to depart at a specific time. Um, I really kind of took it at my own pace and. And of course, mindful to the outreach planned events. Um, but you know, I think the fact that um, health-wise, I, I worked out at the hotels whenever I could. Um, just when I would get out of the aircraft and I was away from the outreach event, I really just had to shut everything off and almost kind of zone into uh, just time with me to kind of reflect on past flights and and, ref and think about the future flights. Uh, so I just, I took that time that I needed. Um, exercise was really, really critical. Hydration was important. There were some hotels around the world um, where they were, they didn't have the amenities that um, most hotels in the United States have. You know, it was a challenge even washing my clothes because uh, at some hotels they didn't have laundry facilities or dry cleaning. Um, but I kept it in mind, you know, every stop, is unique um, and that once I get back, I can do all the dry cleaning and laundry that, that I want to. It's just I kind of dove into the experience, just really appreciated which uh, what each country provided um, and just kind of really immersed myself into all of the experiences and um, took time off when I needed. That sounds great. And um, yeah, those those events that you did were such a huge, important part of the voyage itself. Um, but before we, because I want to talk about that, um, that's like really a huge piece, the whole Dream Soar mission. Um, I'm curious too, though, about ground ground transportation, going through customs, whether that created any delays for you, um, and how you know if any you know if. If anything sort of scary, unusual, or exciting happened when you were on the ground, just getting around in these countries. The nice thing about getting around these countries is that majority of the countries knew that I were that I was coming. We worked a lot with their civil aviation authorities, so oftentimes when I would get to an airport, I would see um, a group of people waiting for me, sometimes with flowers, just welcoming me into their countries, and that helped a lot uh, with with customs as well that was customs is usually pre-arranged um so i didn't experience anything just completely out of the ordinary um and that that was a big thanks to ICAO the international civil aviation organization and all of the participating civil aviation authorities uh but it was it was pretty much once i landed um i would either have to stay in the aircraft and a customs agent would come to me or i'd get off just show them my paperwork um, and from there, I usually would be escorted to um, the airport. I would meet with all the people who were there waiting for me. Sometimes there would be reporters, take pictures, and then kind of head out from the airport uh, to the hotel to rest for the outreach events. Super, super. <clears throat> And so with BizJet, you know, I personally talk to job seeking pilots every day and I'm certain they would want to know now that you've had this experience, what's your dream job or, you know, for a girl who's coming up and thinking she wants to be a pilot, what are some, you know, great ideas for jobs that she should sort of shoot for? So when I first got into aviation, um, I originally wanted to be an airline pilot. And once I started to take classes and really understood um, the airline industry, uh, I thought, you know, that's not the route that I want to go. And I was presented with, well, there's really 
three different boxes of, of uh, categories of pilots. There's a uh, corporate pilot, airline pilot, or military pilot. And I didn't see myself fit into any of these categories. Uh, so what I did is I, I thought to myself, well, what would I like to do? That is to fly general aviation aircraft. That's, that's my passion. That's my love. And to do it in a way where I could inspire other kids, um, just because I, I thought about me growing up and my sisters um, and how important inspiration is to young kids as they're growing up and developing what they want to do in life. So I created my own category, which was um, the founder and president of a nonprofit flying around the world to inspire the next generation. And that's something that I encourage um, the next generation to do is if you don't find a career where you're 100% passionate about, what's to stop you in making your own career? I mean, aviation is so dynamic and there's so much that you can do um, that, you know, you can, you can, you can create. Um, I think you had another question too to that. No, that's okay. Um, I think, I think saying something important, something important, but, but now I'm hearing an echo. Yeah, I'm hearing an echo too. Shoot. We just soldier on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was just one just word one that came out, but, out, but oh man, there's an echo on your end now. I know. I, I know. Think. Maybe give it a minute. Give it a minute. Okay. Because we have about we ten have more about minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. And I've got these. And I've got these about about four. Four. Okay. That I want to get into. I want to get into. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm starting to hear you much better now. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. And I do have more. I do have more. On third, on third page. Third page. Okay. But it's like pretty. It's like pretty. Pretty short now. Short now. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'm just gonna. Okay, I'm just gonna. Know that you go. You go. It doesn't get recorded. Doesn't get recorded. Uh, okay. I know. I hear it too. Okay. Okay. So today, girls so today, in America, girls in America have the opportunity, the opportunity to and be anything, anything they want. But, but in a lot of the countries, a lot of the countries, oh, this is not ugh, working. This is not working. Here, hang on. Here, hang on. Or like, or is it going to interrupt your recording? If if what was if, your if, what was your idea? If you want to like X out and start over, I don't know if it would interrupt your recording. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, can I can. I can try that. Try that. Okay. All right. I might have to send I you. I might have to send you. Okay. Sorry. Keep Sorry. Going. It's up to you. Yeah, but I hear it though. Your, I hear the. Uh, it's like your voice is muffled. Yeah, something happened. Yeah, something happened. All right. All right. I will send I will you. I'll send you in like two minutes. Like two minutes. Okay. No problem. Thanks, Shasta. Thanks, Shasta.